Uh, I'm calling this meeting to order. Uh, the chair notes that there are 10 voting members of the HAC present, which constitutes a majority and therefore a quorum. And unless someone objects, I'm gonna declare a quorum. Ah, now we're up to 11, great. Um, so um, this is the regular monthly HAC meeting for February, 2021. Uh, we have a truncated agenda today. We have got the good fortune to have our uh, brand new uh, city manager here for a chat um, and a meet and greet discussion. Um, we have a couple of new, fo a couple of other new members dropping in, so we'll probably do a quick round robin of introductions. Um, we did not meet in January; that was inauguration day, uh, and we punted. Uh, out of an abundance of caution and of course on the thought that most folks would be at least somewhat distracted there. Um, to start off with a couple of housekeeping matters, I have a definitive uh, declaration to make as chair, which is I am not a cat. Um, just to be clear. Uh, but uh, and if any of you happen to be uh, happen to be feline, I expect you to, to tell that same lie. Um, so um, let's see. Um, we have two main items on the agenda. That is a discussion, uh, sort of city update and discussion with uh, Chip Boyles, our new city manager, and then Lyle, who is absent. Uh, is being substituted by Rory, who will sort of give us a rundown of the last joint session, uh, affordable housing plan, CIP, and progress and lack there, or uh, progress lack thereof, or, or our journey there. Um, anyway, so uh, we do have a couple of new folks, and of course, uh, Chip is new here as well, so I thought we'd just do a quick introduction of who we all are. Uh, and I'll start with me. My name is Phil Duranzio. I am the chair of the HAC. I am the <clears throat> city council's banker rep and the, in my day job, I'm the CEO of Pilot Mortgage. Um, I'm not sure how to proceed in the uh, Hollywood squares here, but uh, Dan, you're next to me. You want to go next? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Phil. I'm Dan Rosenzweig. I'm president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity of Greater Charlottesville. Uh, Juan, I, Juan Diego Wade is new and joining us. Yes, thank you. My name is Juan Diego Wade. I'm a member of the City of Charlottesville School Board, um, representative taking over for many years for um, Lisa Torres being on here on the board. So um, I'm looking forward to assisting however I can. Great. Thank you, sir. And welcome, Ridge. Hi, I'm uh, Ridge Schuyler, the Dean of Community Self-Sufficiency Programs at Piedmont Virginia Community College and the founder of Network to Work. And my focus on the hack is trying to help people boost their incomes to afford the housing that is available in our community. Great. Hi, Ridge. Good morning, afternoon, Frank. Hey, how are you? Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm Frank Stoner. I'm a managing partner with uh, Milestone Partners, uh, also on the board of PHA. And I think I might be the member, designated member from the Free Enterprise Forum, maybe. Right. That's been a while. Yeah. Yes. And I guess you could be wearing Sunshine's hat here today as well. He uh, indicated um, that he was uh, a little overbooked. And I tend to believe yes. him. Uh, yes. Because he used language that you would expect from me in describing the calendar. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, he and I are supposed to meet him. later today and he had 30 minutes to 30 minutes in the schedule that was free today after gotcha. 430. Yeah. So anyway. Yes, sir. Well, welcome, Anthony. Hey, I'm uh, the executive director for Thomas Jefferson Area Coalition for the Homeless. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you, sir. Nancy. You're muted. We cannot hear you. Thank you. Hey, you I'm Nancy Kidd, director of the Macahope House Program. And my interest on the hack is to learn how to help bridge the gap for homeless families into affordable housing that um, they can maintain after graduation. Thank you. Great. Michael. I'm Mike Cassano. I am a board member of the Johnston Village Associ uh, Neighborhood Association. Great. Thank you, sir. Jennifer, a long time to see. Hi, Jen. Hi, 
everybody. I'm Jen Jacobs. I'm the executive director of AHIP. We do critical repairs and housing rehabs and energy upgrades for homeowners in Charles Hill and Almoral County. Nice to see everybody. That's Lisa. That's Lisa. Hi. There you are. I'm getting there, Phil. I'm getting there. <laughs> My name is S. Lisa Herndon. I'm a local real estate expert, and I, I'm representing um, the Charlottesville Association of Realtors. Yes. Are Chris, you waiting sir. to say something else? No, no, no. I was poking Chris Meyer. Hi, good, good afternoon, everybody, and apologies for being a little late. Uh, Chris Meyer, the executive director of the Local Energy Alliance Program, LEAP. Uh, we provide a lot of energy efficiency weatherization services to the uh, city of Charlottesville, its residents, and, and the greater Charlottesville area. Uh, we also have the programs from Dominion, uh, for example, in Charlottesville Gas, uh, too. Thanks. Great. Right. Stephen, are you with us? Stephen? Can you hear Sorry, my video is not working. Uh, Steve Stokes with the Jefferson Area Board for Aging. I'm the asset manager here, in charge of all our housing projects. Thank you, sir. My apologies, my video is working. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, then I believe we have, uh, oh, Dr. Pathy, are you with us? Stacy? And then I believe, uh, Aaron, we have you from staff and are you there with us? Yes, Aaron Attack, City of Charlottesville. I'm the grants coordinator. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Brenda. Good afternoon, Brenda Kelly, redevelopment manager and also attempting to temporarily fill the housing program coordinator position. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. And uh, then on my far right, which I know doesn't represent anything politically for you, sir, John Sales. There you are. Sorry, I think that was me. Uh, my name is John Sales. I'm the executive director of the Housing Authority, and I am on here serving as the member of the Housing Authority. Uh, we are probably, I think, the largest affordable housing uh, owner in the city of Charlottesville. Thank you, sir. I believe that's uh, everyone here. And then um, I know that uh, Mr. Boyles's time uh, is uh, a, a bit uh, circumscribed today and that he has probably got more than one or two things on his agenda. And I'm very grateful that you took the opportunity your sort of for second full day on the job to step in. Uh, but I wanted to sort of turn it over to you to sort of make an introduction for yourself and then maybe we can have a bit of a chat. Be glad to, and thank you, thank you so much. Though I'm looking at all the, the faces in the windows, I, I know pretty much everybody here, which makes me feel very comfortable and, and feel very good for, um, for the work that perhaps we were doing over at the, the Planning District Commission. But um, for those I don't know, uh, Chip Boyles, I've been living here in Charlottesville for seven years now, um, came here, um, to be the executive director of the Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission. Um, I think we've been doing a, a halfway decent job over there for the last few years. And uh, prior to this, I, I was actually doing a lot of housing work in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, I had the good fortune because of other people's misfortune, I guess, coming in on the heels of Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Gustav. Um, ooh, there was a couple of other, Hurricane Isaac we had money from, as well as the, um, the economic downturn and the um, Obama stimulus package. Uh, we had more money for housing than we could spend at the time. Um, it, was, it, was, it was something to, to have. Um, but if anybody's familiar with Baton Rouge, Louisiana, there's not enough money to, to fix their housing problems. Um, it's, it's terrible. Um, I'm going to bet they still have blue tarps on roofs 
that they put up after Hurricane Katrina. So, um, but very, very interested in, in all of the housing issues. I think that was evident at the Planning District Commission where when I got there, there wasn't very much discussion on housing at all, but with some of the leadership on our commission, um, housing is probably the second largest program that we're running behind transportation right now um, and, and continuing to grow. So um, something that, that I hope to, to bring that experience here and, and get to work with you all. And, you know, again, it's, it's just so good to see so many familiar faces uh, on this board. I'll be glad to, to talk about any issues. I, I may not have answers today, but um, can certainly try to, to give you my feelings or, or thoughts. Thank you, sir. Well, I mean, I thought it might be productive to sort of have something of a, a bit of a freewheeling discussion and question and answer and just see where, where things take us on, on terms of housekeeping matters. Um, and uh, we don't have a, uh, in, uh, we have a few members of the public um, filed in as well. And if you wished to jump in with a question, I ask that you use the hand raising um, uh, option that's available to you. And I believe um, both Aaron and Brenda are also empowered to sort of pull you in if necessary. So um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. We, are, we do try to keep this as publicly engaged as we can, um, but uh, you know, bear with us on the technology piece. I'll try to keep half an eye on it as well. Um, so with that, does anyone want to sort of kick off with some general, uh, general discussion and we can sort of take it from there? as to where we stand now, what uh, we're looking forward, we're looking at in 2021, and how we think this is uh, what our next steps are, and defining where we are now. Other than, you know, just, just a little stuff. <laughs> I'll take a swing at starting us off. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome Juan to the board. Um, Going to be a huge addition to the, to the hack. Um, it's got significant experience in housing, knows the community, is just a good person. So on, really, really glad to have you here. And um, you. every bit is excited to have Chip um, on as city manager. Um, for those of you who haven't had the benefit of working closely with him, um, uh, he is an expert manager. He is completely invested in this community and cares about affordable housing, um, not just caring about it, but caring enough about it to make sure that that, um, that some of the goals that we need to accomplish to support lower income families in this community get done. But he's, he's, he's done it at the Planning District Commission. If any of you have had the privilege of working with his staff, he's assembled an amazing staff of, <clears throat> of housers who are responsive and hardworking and thoughtful and in a very short period of time has taken that, the Planning District Commission from one that really didn't think much about housing to one that I think is a real leader in terms of that type of an organization. And um, I'm looking forward to the same leadership of the city and Chip, I just want you to know that this, I and personally in this, this, I don't think anybody will disagree on this committee that we're here to help you and support you. And um, no question is too big or too small to throw over the fence. Um, um, we're always happy to spend time um, uh, digging in, looking at policy issues, doing whatever we can to support you and staff and council. Um, quickly, I think there's a, a bit of history of the hack is, is instructive to get us to where we are now. And I'll, I'll keep it really brief. The, in, in the hack was created, it was one of the initiatives of Mayor Dave Norris, um, probably about, about 14 years ago or so. Um, Dave was the first mayor or the first city councilor elected on a platform of affordable housing. Uh, he made it his probably his number one priority. Uh, and the hack was originally generated to produce a study to sit, to outline what the what the issues are, and to come up with a suggestion for funding and programming to address the the issues. Um, it was a. a, a it was decided by city council to keep it on as a standing um, uh, recommending body um, to city council. So the, the org chart from what I ended from the charter of the hack is that the, much like the planning commission, 
this is a recommending body to city council. Um, uh, we're, we've always been at our best when we work uh, in conjunction with staff. Um, uh, and there have been, been times in the history where, uh, where this has been a really great resource for staff. Um, th there are a number of initiatives that we've, we've looked at, studied, uh, spent a significant amount of time in subcommittee and uh, brought forward the council has adopted as policy. Uh, for example, the uh, city um, funded and city-based housing choice voucher program uh, was in uh, direct, it was an idea that, that came from this group, uh, but even more importantly, it was an idea that needed some thinking about how you actually implement it. Uh, and it's, it's really positioned Charlottesville as first among cities of its size for having a program like this. The, the most important thing is that, that within a year, 100 families um, who were really struggling to find safe, decent, affordable housing were able to do so. Um, uh, and we've also, we also were able to create a program uh, in consultation with council and uh, the city attorney's office and staff uh, that allows us to experiment with um, other um, ways of doing a voucher program that are a little bit more flexible uh, and people friendly than what you get when you utilize HUD vouchers. So uh, the re recertification requirements, et cetera, um, are much more to the benefit of families than, um, than a typical HUD um, voucher. It, they're also portable uh, to a degree uh, in the county. So it's one of the few um, uh, uh, subsidies uh, that is able to cross jurisdictional lines. So that's an example of the type of, of work that this committee has done and can do. And again, so I would invite you to, um, um, to throw anything that you want over the fence and we'll, we'll take time to study it and, and bring back recommendation or a series of, of options. Um, moving forward, I think that there's um, fairly strong sentiment in the um, housing plan or the emerging draft of the housing plan to, um, to uh, reconstitute hack. And in particular, um, I, I think if there is one sort of uh, component of controversy, it's that hack had a subcommittee uh, purposefully carved out of people who would never um, um, uh, applaud, be applicants for CAF funds, but in the absence of another a type of committee or another structure for making recommendations and vetting and um, uh, applications for Charlottesville affordable housing funds. Uh, there was a subcommittee, but I, the recommendation, and I'm pretty sure that everybody on this committee stands behind this, the recommendation is that that become a separate committee independent from HACC just to um, eliminate the perception of, of impropriety or potential impropriety. Um, but that the hack remain as a, as a uh, policy based and a recommending body for council. And um, I can speak for myself personally, we're really looking forward as the, house, the, the housing policy gets adopted um, to, to really being the, doing a lot of the blocking and tackling so that we can begin to implement um, and track the, uh, the most important initiatives. So that was a mouthful. I apologize for stealing others' thunder, but I, I thought a little bit of horse, his, historical perspective might might be helpful. Thank you, sir. Well, um, and you know, to be not to um, engage in too much self congratulatory congratulatory behavior, but you know, the um, the sort of sense of trying to meld a housing plan with the comprehensive plan with the uh, sort of serious look at a rezone. Uh, was something that grew out of this, uh, the strategy subcommittee um, that sort of led to our uh, development plan here. That was something that we kind of pitched to city council as an idea to how to integrate these things, which brought uh, the consultants in to do the work that they're doing. Um, and now we seem to be, I wouldn't say home stretch, but at least in the back stretch of that development process. So we're looking forward to taking another swing at where they sit and where we are on it. Um, anyway, any, uh, any other commentary on uh, where we are and what we're doing and what we're looking forward to? I'll, I'll throw an idea out that's, that's pre-yesterday pre that I think will be very beneficial. Um, 
putting the, the planning district hat on one last time, perhaps, is as they're completing their regional housing plan, which because of timing and, and different things, Charlottesville at the time was way ahead um, in, in their housing plan efforts. Um, but I think the Planning District Commission, though it did not directly include Charlottesville in that, that regional plan, I think, you know, we were always very out, it was always very evident that you can't, you know, completely exclude Charlottesville. It's the hub of, of this bigger housing wheel. And I think that they're taking a, a more active look to make sure to accommodate and, and take in the city's housing plan and make sure that it is a very strong component within that regional plan. So I think that's a way HAT could, could really provide some assistance in how, how is best to, to marry those two. Uh, marries, how's best to include the city's plan in the regional effort. Um, so I just throw that out there for perhaps you all to be thinking about um, because I think it's crucial both for the outlying counties to consider Charlottesville and it's equally crucial for us to be considering the outlying counties as well. So I just throw that out as a potential um, effort that you may want to look into if you haven't already. Well, it's been sort of a constant refrain here that uh, we are dealing with a um, sort of a jurisdictional siloing problem. Uh, and it's, it is difficult to sort of take, uh, and we have struggled and talked about taking steps beyond the first sort of initial couple of steps about trying to integrate and having a co cohesive regional policy. And that's an ongoing um, I mean, that's, a, that's an ongoing thing. I mean, we, we've, and we even have pulled people in from the community. You know, I mean, uh, Stacy Pethy is over in the county and she's here to, to provide that perspective. Uh, but I, you're not gonna find any argument from anyone on this panel <laughs> that these 10 point, these 10.4 square miles uh, in maybe jurisdictionally independent, but we're terribly inter interdependent in every, way in, in housing. And I can give a little update on that. Um, city staff has been talking to TJPDC staff um, and we will be coordinating. So basically the, the information provided in the draft housing plan will be incorporated into the regional housing plan. So we're starting those discussions now with staff. Anyone else want to jump in here? And some, somebody's uh, got to talk about money or something. I that's mean, right. Come well, on. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to jump in and talk about money, but from the from the uh, uh, the uh, residents' point of view, um, Chip, with your help, as you know, we recently just published the Orange Dot 4.0 report, which looks at the what it takes to survive uh, in terms of income in our community, and as the Orange Dot suggests. Um, nearly one out of every five families does not earn enough to be self-sufficient. That lack of self-sufficiency really is driven by the cost of housing, as you know. And when you look at the cost of housing, um, Charlottesville, Albemarle, and, and on into the, some of the outlying counties, the cost of housing, if you're paying market rates, is $15,000 a year for an average two-bedroom apartment. Um, yet we have one out of every five families that make less than $35,000 a year, which means they are paying more than half of their income on rent. Um, and so, you know, my suggestion as part of the housing plan is that we work on both sides of the ledger so that we're not only trying to make units more affordable, but we're also boosting incomes to help people afford what exists. And so I'm hoping that a, a housing plan is truly comprehensive looking at at both sides of that ledger because people are really striving to move up the income ladder. Ultimately, I think for most of our job seekers that, that we work with, we've worked with over a thousand now, um, a, a huge majority of them want to be homeowners. They don't wanna just be renters the rest of their lives. So the housing plan 
need, you know, I'm hoping we'll consider both, you know, how do we provide more affordable rentals? Um, how do we move people up the income ladder so they can afford the housing that exists? And how do we move people into a place where they can become homeowners, where they are building assets that they can pass on to their children? So that's the perspective that I come at this with. And I know that a lot of my uh, fellow members of the hack um, agree to that as well. Uh, and so that we're hoping to see that as part of the plan. So uh, thank you, Chip, especially for uh, you lent one of your staffers to me to help create the maps that were included in the Orange Dot report that we issued on January 20th. And I really do appreciate the help of the PDC to create a regional snapshot of, of where families are and where the struggles are and how we might address them. Okay. Well, Ridge, we were, we were certainly glad to do that because that Orange Dot report is, is so beneficial you know, to the entire region. And um, you know, you, I, I support what you're saying 100%. What I really like about increasing the income is it helps with the housing affordability, but it helps with everything else too. I mean, you know, health, you, know, you, you name it. So um, if, if we can get incomes up, we start checking off more boxes than just the housing boxes. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Just wanted to add something around coordination. You know, and you might notice that there's not a representative from UVA, unless correct me if I'm wrong here. That someone nope, is. You are correct, sir. The call, and we haven't had anybody for chair for how long? From UVA? Uh, over over a year, actually. I reached out uh, to uh, senior leadership at. Uh, UVA and they were actually expressed an interest in getting back to me of getting a new appointment in there and that conversation happened um, well in March of 2020 and shockingly enough um, folks became focused and distracted by other matters and uh, have, uh, which I can't really blame them for and it's been sort of emergency management since but we do need to circle back to the university <clears throat> Uh, now that we have this reconstituted uh, new normal-ish and um, see what we can do, but you are correct. I think just, just personally, you know, we, we've seen a lot of discussion or talk from UVA leadership about coordinating on the, you know, the question of the housing challenge, but to a certain extent, I think, at least in this body and, and you know, would say around is I'm not saying this has to be the hub for that that coordination and collaboration but you know I think we'd be interested in having something from UVA and I don't know how much Chip you've worked with UVA previously uh, but you know facilitating a, a more engaged relationship with UVA uh, I think would be helpful you know uh, especially around housing. And, and, and I will say and, and it, this may be something to build from and um I, I hate to keep referencing back to the planning district commission, but, but there is a lot of housing activity there. Um, a, a more active role perhaps, and I don't know what that would look like um, by hack on the regional housing partnership. Um, I, I do have to say University of Virginia has been very active since day one of the creation of that, that regional advisory board um, and, and, you know, been very open with discussions. Um, you know, certainly I think that would be nice to, to bring it to the city as well, but that may also be one way to begin that relationship is, is through that because they're, they have been very active with the, the regional housing partnership. Yeah, and uh, worth noting, uh, in case you guys missed the news uh, just a week or two ago, uh, UVA announced that it was reforming the, uh, yep. the working groups that they had formed back last March. Um, so they've committed to building 1,000 to 1,500 affordable housing units on land that UVA and the UVA Foundation own. Um, and they just sent out a press release saying that they're getting back to work on it because uh, you know they got distracted by COVID after they initially sent out the press release last March. Sir, what else? I just just um, bootstrapping off of what Rory just said. Um, you know, those those that working group uh, once it's constituted, 
um, would create a great liaison with the Housing Advisory Committee and somebody from that working group, you know, could serve on the on the hack, which would be which would be great because then it would tie that working group together with the actual work that's being done on the ground by this by this body. So I think that would be that would be wonderful. Um, we've we've just reconstituted and restood up the pipelines and pathways working group, which is the one about working with the university to help people move up the income ladder uh, with with UVA and community partners. Um, uh, so that you know these these things are back underway. So I'm on that housing advisory working group that just that is reconvening now. Great. Ta -da! <laughs> Yay. Hey, Jen, have, have, has UVA appointed their representatives to that working group yet, or are they still working on that, as far as you know? Well, there's the group from the, like, like the community. Well, there's some community people, like Joy Johnson's on it, um, Harold Fuller's on it, and, and me from the, from the community group, right, representing community groups. And then there are other like developers, and, and then there's like, so there's like a couple different, and then because we had a meeting of like a kickoff meeting yesterday. And then there's a group of like, there's like the project team and there's a lot of UVAF people on that. And then there are also like staff support from the like the, the provost office like there. And then there's the project people from the consultant that they've hired to do a lot of the work that it really kind of mimics a little bit the um, the process that we've seen kind of unfold in this city. Um, so sp speaking about like trying to, to cohere these at some point, I think would be a good idea, but it was just, it was just a lot of information sort of disseminated yesterday. So it was, so there were UVA people sitting there in addition to like the, the core members who were appointed to the advisory group. Thank you, ma'am. So um, I, while I have you, I, I just had a, a question. Um, that, so when we talk about the planning, like the, you know, the planning that's going on in the city and regional housing partnership planning and trying to, you know, coalesce and now hopefully the UVA stuff can all come together. You know, there's a lot of feedback and, and planning and hopes and dreams around like, you know, funding and deploying the funding and, and um, something that we've talked about, like some of the other, the housing, my housing siblings that I've talked about is the staffing on the city level to be able to, to actually deploy the plan once it's once it's you know in motion. Um, and I know the the poor NDS people have been short staffed forever and there's been just a lot of um, you know in, instability or staff transitions I should say in and out. Um, and I know there's like Brenda's been doubling up forever it feels like uh, doing several different jobs at once. So I, I'm just I wanted to get your kind of thoughts about and I know you're you're brand new and you've got everything at once. <laughs> but I'm just wondering if you've if you've thought about like how to shore up the internal infrastructure to be able to support the plan and the organizations and the community that are trying to do the work. Right now, something that we're struggling with is who do we even everybody's so overworked and there's been so much, you know, motion and pandemic and all of that. It's hard to know who we even talk to about getting feedback on on things. So I'd like to get your thoughts on that if you have any yet. And then since you brought it up, I just, can we have some money? <laughs> so, um, I'd like to sort of piggyback and add uh, sort of an appendix to that question and sort of uh, to sort of tie that up a little bit um, and to put it in somewhat stark relief is that we've spent, we, we recognize the enormity of the housing problem we have here. We have spent, you know, years uh, looking at uh, policies and putting forth programs and reviewing existing programs and and looking at larger plans and uh, we the, uh, the city has spent uh, considerable funds on developing a comprehensive housing plan um, and there is a bit of concern um, in terms of well now that we're getting to the back stretch of that and we're going to start implementing uh, you know Jen's right we've got a bandwidth uh, question here about how we can get this done with the number of people that we have. And, and frankly, um, you know, in the last four years, we've had um, five people nominally sit, well, six, six 
housing program coordinators, five technically, but you know, Brenda Grover Cleveland uh, uh, Kelly over there has been uh, non-consecutively in that job. And we've had, as you know, I guess five city managers in four years that we, it seems to us, and it seems to me, I don't want to speak for the whole hack, but having spent this time, this effort and having made the commitment, I mean, I've got some concerns that we have the infrastructure and the people uh, to, uh, and that we'll be able to pull people in to get this stood up and working and that we are gonna get the right sort of, sort of senior management skills and the middle management skill set that we need to stand up and coordinate and get all of this moving. And, you know, I have every confidence in you, but I also know that you spend almost a third of your life asleep. So there are certain, <laughs> You know, there's only so much you can do. <laughs> Sleep, yes. Um, you're so. I mean, you're so right. With if if you don't have the the personnel infrastructure in place, um, I do think we're in a really good place because a lot of the planning is is being taken care of. Um, I also believe that we're in a a really better place. We aren't where we should be, but we're in a better place to be looking um, around us with partnerships with UVA, with Albemarle County, with other jurisdictions. My directive so far from council, and, and I see Council of Payne on here too, has been that our one of our main focuses is to stabilize the staffing and start it with the top. Um, we've got to get some deputy city managers in and we have to, you know, use them then to help each of the department heads and right on down the line to get the right people in place. Um, one of the things that bothers me, uh, a lot of the staff that's, that's on the call, I'm sure they've already heard me talking about it. It's getting the right people too. I mean, it, it does not help us at all just to fill positions if we have to turn around and, and fill them again, or even worse, fill them with the wrong people. So right now, you know, one of my top three priorities is to begin filling from the top so that those people can then start filling the rest of the way down. Because um, you're, you're so right, we've got to have the right people in place. Uh, the other thing, you know, along those lines, it's this is the the worst possible time to have everything all lined up for implementing new initiatives. And there is just no resources to implement those in the coming year. Um, you know, we're hoping for a turnaround in the economy. But right now, I mean, we're we're very close to ten million dollars below what we had estimated for general fund revenues for FY21. Uh, we anticipate that that revenue sources will be very lower than expected initially in FY22. Um, so we're we're having to come in in a very very conservative fiscal posture. Um, but a number of the positions that it's my understanding, at least, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a, a day and a half into this. A number of positions are funded, though. We just have to get those filled. And it's some of the upper level positions that are empty that cause the delays in getting the rest of the positions filled. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things we're working on very, very strongly, very rapidly, and trying to, to get, especially the ones that we have the money for, that we have budgeted, get those filled. The other thing is, is that it, it may take a little while, and I've had conversations with some of you, of, you know, kind of changing the way we do business too, trying to, to get things through the pipeline. Um, I know when it comes to housing, there just should not be the delays that, that a lot of us have experienced in the past. Um, if we can move more product through the pipeline, I think we're gonna end up with a benefit for all of us. And it's, it's easier to manage if we're able to take a project and get it, get it to construction in a shorter period of time, you know, it's easier for us to handle internally. 
uh, so that we can we can do more. So, um, I mean, that's it. I hope that kind of answers it. But but it is a priority to start getting people in place, especially at the upper level, so that they can get the right people in place all the way through the chain. Sure. Or pipe. Pipes are better, not chain. <laughs> And I don't, I mean, I, and, and to, to talk about the money, I don't mind saying it's, it's, it's going to be a tough year. It's, it's going to be a really tough year um, coming up. And boy, I hope I'm speaking to you again in a few months and go, man, we missed it. You know, sales are back up. Um, people are paying their property taxes on time. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we're wrong because if we are, it's not that we don't collect the money. We're going to put the money. We're going to amend the budget and then put it into the priorities that council want us to. Um, we just don't have the luxury of being wrong and spending money that we don't have. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, uh, we're all anxious about forward motion. I mean, we all sort of understand that that you know, 2020 in a lot of ways is a is a is a lost year. Uh, there were plans that were made that you know we we weren't able to be self actualized as a city or even as you know in our organizations. Uh, it was more of a you know tread water, stabilize, provide the services you can you can provide build the airplane in flight for an entirely new way of uh, delivering, you know, services and delivering, you know, delivering your, your uh, needs to your clients. And, um, but we've done that and stabilized that somewhat, uh, but we got a long way to go uh, before we can actually start taking strides forward that we really need to take. There isn't an, I don't see an easy forward I don't see an easy path forward, but there's an imperative to make one anyway. I do. I, can, I would. I would like to say I do see, and I'm. I'm hoping, you know, to relay this to to all of our staff at the city, um, not just in the housing initiatives, but but especially the housing initiatives. I saw something a while, a number of years ago that during the economic downturns nationally. As the economy goes down, the number of new patent requests go up. People, when, when things are hard, they start thinking of new and better ways of doing things. Because, because I can't speak for everybody. I can speak for myself. At times when I have money, I can get really lazy. I mean, you know, very complacent of doing things just the same way. Um, when I don't have money, boy, I can I can stretch that that lunch meat a little bit further. I can think of new ways to do things. I'm hoping that that's one of the bright spots to come out of this is that we're able to change some of our processes for the better, even if it's out of necessity. Um, but being creative, looking, and also you know asking council to allow us to take some risk. Um, local government's not like business. I mean, you, you expect certain, certain businesses to try new products, and if it fails, they take it off the shelf and, and start over. Local government, you know, you're not expected to fail because it's public dollars. Um, I'm just hoping we can have a little bit of leeway so we can try some new things and see what we can do with that, and, and maybe there will be some very positive outcomes out of these very trying times. I appreciate that very much, Chip. And again, I think that's the perspective we need to have in terms of leadership at the at the city. It's 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 trying new things. It's thinking a little bit more entrepreneurial, and recognizing that some of the challenges that we, but not not we on this call primarily, but we the folks that we work in partnership with, um, can't afford not to take uh, those risks because the the need is so great. Um, you know, in terms of funding, I totally hear you. You know, I was wrapped watching the planning commission look at the CIP this year and, and clearly revenues are a challenge. The one thing I would um, 
encourage you to do as you start to sharpen your pencil a little bit as the budget process moves through is to look and see uh, what are the rungs on the housing ladder that, that uh, have not been funded for a while. Um, because I do think that we run the risk of, um, of underinvesting on certain rungs that creates log jams, real serious log jams for people trying to move through and up uh, the housing ladder. And so I would, I would look at that. I would also encourage you to think strategically about out years in the CIP. I know that that's, that's funny money. It doesn't really exist, but it also signals um, um, where, uh, where the city would like to make investments in uh, presuming the economy rebounds and revenues are, are back up. So those are my two suggestions about that. I, I appreciate that very much, Dan, um, because I believe that's what helped get us into the financial situation out, outside of the pandemic, outside of the, you know, the loss of, of sales and revenues. Um, we've had, we have a lot of deferred, very important infrastructure items and programs um, that by not looking at it in a long enough term, you know, now they're coming due. There are, there are some things that, that have to be done. And I think it's crucial for us to start looking beyond that, even that five-year horizon, because when a 50 or a $100 million item becomes necessary, it sucks everything else up into it. Um, and, and other areas are just as necessary, but they get lost in, in that vacuum. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to hit um, just as a matter of housekeeping that uh, Chip uh, committed to 45 minutes uh, with us and we're at uh, 52 minutes at this point. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to sort of press upon you more than uh, uh, more than you agreed to. So if um, there are any sort of final questions, queries, comments. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll add one um, and also just happy to work with you in this new capacity, Chip. Uh, I hope that you know that we all, as far as I can tell, are really here to support you in any way we can. Um, so please, you know, just know that that's, that's there. Um, and I may, I might be kind of on a limb on this, but I felt important, I don't know, I felt important to say about kind of hacks charge and role moving forward with the housing plan that's coming out of the city. I think you know, either that's something we need to, to maybe focus on as as the hack, um, maybe in conjunction with you as well, just to have more, a little bit more clarity on are we, you know, responsible for carrying that out in some degree, or just providing guidance on how it's carried out. Um, I think I think that would help us kind of understand how to move forward in a more productive manner, especially in relation to, you know, roles and responsibilities of of other you know staff at the city versus the hack. And, how can we be truly supportive um, moving forward? So I just wanted to name that. Um, and again, I'm not sure if that's our own internal thing that we need to do um, or if it's something we can do in conjunction, but I wanted to name that. Sure. Thank you, Anthony, for mentioning that. We're very eager to get to work and be helpful. Uh, we do best, I think, when we, uh, and we have had success with this, where the council or staff has handed us an issue and said, you know, turn it inside out and upside down and come back with some recommendations. Uh, we tend to, I, I mean, I think we do a pretty good job of that. Uh, we did that with the CISRAP program, which we originated here with the planning issues with, um, with developing the land bank, which is at 98% completion and a couple of other things. But yeah, thank you, Anthony. I, 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 don't, think you, I don't think you stretched out at all on that. I think you're right where the rest of us are. Well, I will run. I, I will ask one thing. I mean, that's, you know, usually my standard kind of closing is, you know, please get in touch with me. Um, if, if my time, if I have the time, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a call. I'll, I'll respond to emails. Um, I'm looking at these faces. I don't think I have to say that. Um, you, you've, you've been very free with my time for the last several years. I don't see any of that changing with most of you. So, um, and, and, but I welcome that. The thing I do ask that can be confusing, um, especially for me, my, my memory's not great. Um, 
when we are talking about things, making it clear to me too, perhaps, are, are, you, are you speaking as a hack member or are you speaking as in, in some other capacity too? Um, sometimes I, I, I might be, be, be talking with somebody and I'm thinking, well, you know, this could be a hack initiative when it's really not, it might be their own personal one. Um, so, you know, just kind of feel free whenever you're calling or, or we're together, just remind me which hat you're wearing. And it will really help me perhaps to, to be able to um, make sure that I'm looking at it the right way. Thank you, I do have to run though. All right, well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking the time on your day number two here. <laughs> Glad Thank to. You. We'll do it again soon. Thank you, sir. Take Thanks, care. Sir. Okay. Bye bye. All right. So the only other um, uh, initiative we had on the uh, was to get an update from the Planning Commission, focused sort of on last week's session, and uh, Lyle wasn't able to uh, make it, but Rory agreed to parachute in with uh, circles and arrows and charts and graphs, or at least a cogent summary. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me, guys. Um, Lyle uh, sends his apologies for not making it, um, but uh, he had something come up. Um, so yeah, last uh, last Tuesday, we had a uh, joint session, work session with council uh, talking about the updated, or I guess we're now sort of calling it the final affordable housing plan. Um, I know you guys have probably talked about it kind of at length in the past, so I'll mostly just talk about kind of the changes um, and kind of where it's going from here. Um, so as I understand it, uh, that was kind of the last time the, the affordable housing plan in itself will be uh, coming for the commission, really. Um, it's not going to be adopted as a separate, like, standalone thing. It's going to kind of get rolled into uh, the overall comp plan process um, that's expected to wrap up in about June. Um, so as we go on from here, uh, you know, they went to council yesterday and they got kind of a nod or a go ahead from them. Um, and so now we're going to be saying, you know, this is pretty much the plan. Um, it's not going to be explicitly separately adopted, but as we implement our comp plan recommendations and our land use map and such, uh, we'll be, uh, you know, rolling in the things that we, you know, have been thinking about with that plan. Um, so uh, the big changes uh, since probably the previous drafts uh, you've seen, and if you go look at our agenda last Tuesday uh, on page 44, um, it, there's a summary of changes. Uh, so, um, you know, number one is uh, that 10 million a year uh, that we've talked about over 10 years is now broken down um, a little bit more specifically and, you know, arguably, uh, you know, in a way that reduces maybe the money we were talking about, but instead of saying, you know, 10 million a year, um, you know, unspecified uses, uh, it's 70 or 7 million in direct subsidy. Uh, it's 2 million in tax relief um, for, uh, you know, like the CHAP program um, and real estate tax relief for low income and uh, elderly homeowners. Um, and, and that I think is about uh, what we're spending now on those programs. Uh, and then it's another million dollars a year um, in administrative costs uh, to build up that staff capacity uh, to be able to run and implement all these programs. Um, other big changes, uh, they added another affordable housing intervention. Um, and that one is a local mortgage pool uh, with individual development accounts um, where, so the basic concept is uh, you'll have like a consortium of government and local lenders um, and maybe some nonprofits um, and they'll be originating mortgage loans to people that wouldn't necessarily qualify for a conventional 30 year fixed mortgage. Um, and that wouldn't require uh, significant down payments. I think they're saying something like a $3,000 down payment um, and that money would get directed into um, a, a development account that belongs to uh, that homeowner. Um, and so, uh, you know, if they ever get behind on paying their mortgage, uh, they can use those funds uh, to help them get through that rough patch. Um, and, uh, you know, I think with kind of government putting in funds to help, uh, you know, subsidize the overall program, that reduces the risk for the mortgage lenders um, and, and is going to make them willing to participate it, in it. And then the IDA uh, will you know, actually apparently it's been shown to uh, significantly reduce default rates um, to prevent, uh, you know, default and foreclosure. So, um, 
that I think is the big change. Um, there were some other minor changes. There's a lot more detail on regional collaboration with the county and outlying counties, um, in particular, uh, you know, on the urban ring. Um, there uh, was more about energy efficiency um, and and how we can use the acquisition part of the plan uh, to, uh, to you know make energy efficiency improvements. Um, I think those are the big ones. Uh, does anyone have any questions or any any more detail I can provide? Rory, was there any follow up? Maybe and maybe this uh, is less uh, housing plan than it is comp plan update. Uh, but was there any follow up on the idea of middle density as being a specific tool for advantaging affordable housing as opposed to just creating middle density? Yes. So I did actually ask about that, um, and uh, yeah. So the consultants are really seeing that as you know the affordable housing plan will kind of say soft density as a vague concept. And then as we get into the comp plan, uh, you know, we'll, we'll flesh that out more. Um, so they didn't really see a need to, to further elaborate within the affordable housing plan, but you know, it's certainly gonna be uh, a big part of what we're talking about um, in, the, uh, in the land use stuff. So uh, we do have a work session coming up next Tuesday on the um, future land use map. Uh, and I know, you know, in their set of questions for, you know, what planning commissioners should be thinking about, uh, one of the big ones, um, you know, probably even one of the most actionable ones that isn't like, you know, vague, what are you thinking is, uh, how do you feel about soft density and, and how it should work? Um, and, you know, I'll say the way I'm thinking about it, uh, and not necessarily speaking for the other planning commissioners or the consultants or anything is, um, you know, I think it, it makes a lot of sense uh, to have by right, uh, you know, denser housing, uh, especially in, you know, historically exclusionary high income neighborhoods and high opportunity neighborhoods. Um, and I, I think the point that you guys are making about, uh, you know, advantaging affordable housing even further uh, makes a lot of sense as well. Um, so, you know, to me, I don't really see a reason why we should necessarily uh, just stop at fourplexes as, as the max you could possibly do. You know, if you're doing 100% affordable housing, um, why shouldn't you be able to put up an eight flex uh, in North downtown or something? Um, you know, especially in those in those really expensive neighborhoods where you need to amortize that land cost because land is very expensive um, over more units uh, in order to pencil it out. Um, and, you know, where uh, I think it, um, you know, again, they're, they're the high opportunity neighborhoods uh, with tons of amenities and where people really want to live um, and, and how where they've explicitly and purposely forced people out um, forever. Like we know there isn't a health and safety reason um, to allow, you know, some types of housing in one place or another. Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, I think if you're building affordable housing, you should be able to put up as much as you can make work. Um, so that's kind of my position on it. Um, we'll see how much other commissioners agree with that. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Rory. Question? Yeah, Rory, just, uh... And, and thanks for that. I did note that, and, and Leap, I guess, is to a certain extent excited about the the more energy efficiency. You know, again, because that's what we do, being being noted as as a tool. And, and we, we were in rehab, being kind of teased out also. And, and I know Jen, we we talked about this a bit the other day over email. But um, there was it was saying that the the CIP is going to somehow come up with three point one million dollars over the next five years. Um, for rehab and energy efficiency work. And I just want everybody to know that <laughs> I, I don't know how that, I don't know how they got that calculation. And at least from Leap's perspective. Um, anyway, so it's like, who would we talk to, to to try to dig into those calculations and understand better at least? Um, um, sorry, where are you seeing that? In the slide where you're, you were talking about how they, they break out 40, $40 million over five years from the CIP kind of telling everybody like, hey, don't worry, you've already kind of got most of this covered already. Hmm. I think it was slide. I think that might be including, yeah, let me know which slide it is, but. I, and it's specific to the CIP. And, and so I know in the CIP that we approved the other day, um, it's got something like 625,000 over five years in, I think it's 125,000 a year. Yeah. in uh, energy efficiency stuff, which for some reason isn't included in the affordable housing category in the CIP. I think because it 
it's older than that. Um, but I think in the already have it covered slide, uh, they're talking primarily about, you know, the, the tax relief we already do. Well, anyway, we, we can take this, I don't want to say it sooner, but I was just wondering who, who should we contact to discuss that, to, to better understand how they did that? Because I think they were, they're considering, for example, the CAHP as being all rehab. For example, if I was trying to do the math in my head and understand where they're got, and obviously that doesn't all go to, to rehab, um, for example. Yeah, so I mean, if you reach out uh, to the consultants at their um, okay. things on their website, info at cbillplanstogether.com or something, yeah. um, they're pretty responsive there. Um, so I'm sure they'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll ping them about that. Thank you very much. But yeah, look, I was impressed with the, the updating that they had done and to make it a final draft. Anyways, the revisions they had done, sorry. Thanks. Great. Anything further? So uh, anything from the uh, members of the public, if you want to raise your hand or otherwise ping? Phil, Chair, sorry, just real, real quick, I got an update on the short-term rental legislation. Um, sure. The, I was going to sort of deal with this issue and then I was going to oh. deal, I was I'm doing it step by step here. Sorry. I was going to do it with Chip as well, but he had to scurry, so. Apologies, I'll. I'll yeah, so, but that's fine. Uh, and anything, any other questions or comments for Rory at this time? I don't think I see anything. Oh yeah, I'd also add, um, so uh, of course, council yesterday afternoon uh, had a, their own work session with the uh, consultants um, and asked a, a whole number of questions. Um, and they indicated that they had other questions they were gonna ask um, of the consultants. Um, and it wasn't totally clear to me whether that meant they were just gonna take you know, some meetings offline you know, one-on-one. -on -one or if they were gonna have a work session on it. Um, but I would expect to see some more clarification or, or questions from council soon, maybe publicly, maybe not. Maybe Councilor Payne knows. Well, that was, um, there was one councilor who indicated that um, they wanted more time to ask questions one-on-one -on -one with the consultant. So um, at this time, I, I'm not aware of any, um, additional work session among all of council that would there would be, um, you know, perhaps there could be, but I'm not aware of any plans for that at the moment. Gotcha. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Rory. Chris, you said you had an update. Yeah. Uh, we, you uh, certainly remember the analysis that got done. Uh, a request on the hack and you know, reviewing the short-term rental uh, issues that might be facing the city. Uh, there was a, a bill created uh, in conjunction with Delegate Hudson that would basically mandate uh, short-term rental companies like Airbnb or VRBO to share uh, the listing information and kind of uh, lodging information from all of their different rentals, uh, short-term rentals that have been happening in each month. Um, that bill uh, was favorably reviewed by all the commissioners of revenue, uh, including our own here in Todd Divers, but unfortunately because of the limitations that uh, the legislators had regarding the amount of bills they could uh, introduce, it, it didn't get picked up this year. Uh, but Delegate Hudson has I think promised us that uh, she will definitely take it and, and considering a normal legislative year uh, next year uh, would introduce it. So, uh, and that again is not to say you can't do short-term rentals or anything like that, is just again, trying to make sure that our uh, own NDS and, and other officials have the information at their hands to better understand what is happening and regulate it if they so choose. We're gonna make sure we're collecting taxes on it if, if, if it's happening. So, um, Anyways, unfortunately, that did not happen this uh, General Assembly, but again, hopefully will be reintroduced next year or introduced next year. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I am, I am metaphysically certain that this is a battle that is being fought in many, many, many localities. And a part of me is just absolutely content to let somebody else strike the first couple of blows there and uh, deal with the first 
presumably uh, potential litigation <laughs> uh, flowing out of those sorts of regulations and statutes. Uh, but uh, that is not something that's going away. Um, any anything else to bring before this committee at this time? I know we're uh, running. A, we're uh, we've got time on the clock, but if uh, if I could just just quickly, you know, hit this point again for those who have seen the budget work sessions, they'll be aware of this. But I just want to highlight the position of the CIP is at this point with the fifty million dollars for school reconfiguration which could be closer to 100 million, but assuming that it's just 50 million, assuming that we eliminated the new expenditures for West Main Street streetscape, and even assuming we eliminated or reducing funding at least um, for the parking garage, the CIP would still be in a situation where our debt service fund over the midterm, over the next several years will be depleted, you know, in a five to 10 year time horizon. Um, affording the CIP staff's uh, recommend, not recommendation, but analysis would require a minimum of a uh, 10 cent increase over time in the real estate tax rate, um, or perhaps some other mixture of tax increases that um, meet that level. And that even doing that would, uh, again, deplete the debt service fund, leave no additional room in the CIP for new projects particularly large new projects. And it would also freeze up the general fund to a large extent. So there wouldn't be a whole lot of room to do new general fund expenditures. So it's a pretty, it's an extremely difficult budget reality that we're gonna be facing over the next um, five years or so. And I certainly don't know the, uh, the answer or solution, but I think we just need to take a, a hard realistic look at the reality in front of us and um that's going to require looking at infrastructure it's going to require certainly more conversation with schools just about it's going to require conversation about revenue but across the board i don't know if as as a city council um we've yet honestly grappled with that reality the budget situation and this is sort of you know not totally germane to this conversation but something you know i've thought more and more is that um you know, I really question our ability to strike at the roots of some of these issues if we don't have the ability to do progressive taxation. And that's a big lift. That's a long-term project. It requires state legislation. But increasingly, I do really wonder if we're not taking aim at trying to get a land value tax um, authorization to do progressive taxation based on value of land, value of property, income, et cetera, that, um, we may not really be able to strike at the roots of some of this stuff. So that's separate and not germane to this discussion, but I think it's something that, uh, you know, may be worth thinking about, uh, you know, over the long term. It, Michael, on that, I mean, and it is part of the comprehensive plan. I mean, to a certain extent, we are making our property tax progressive and by reducing and subsidizing or canceling out lower income folks uh, property taxes, correct? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'm just, I'm just saying is you're, you're, you mentioned needing a, a more of a progressive property tax, but to a certain extent we already have that capability because we're using tax mayor money to subsidize people who meet I would conditions and, and not charge them property tax, correct? I would caution about that because it helps make it a little bit more progressive, but it's still not really accomplishing the ultimate goal because, and it's good, it's helping, but it's not everything, not even close to what I think we need because there are limits set by the state government for the value of your property that can qualify for that relief. I think it's $350,000. And as assessments keep rising, every single year, fewer and fewer people qualify for that program. So even though we've expanded it, I think last year, the amount of money that went out with it was reduced because the amount of people who qualify under those state limits keeps going down. And so it's a positive thing. It is helping. But there are some really strong, strict limits to how progressive we can get with it. Yeah, I mean, it is sort of a backdoor workaround to a progressive tax uh, system, and it 
has its limits and I agree with Councillor Payne, we're kind of at it, those limits for what we can do there. Um, so we had this discussion in the CIP hearing and uh, from what I heard, I think there was still some room to expand it. Um, I think Mayor Walker said that. Uh, we're, we're, there are limits to it by state code, but we're under them. Um, maybe not on the, the max property value, but uh, you know, certainly oh. there's still a lot of homes under 350 in this town. One would hope that you know, if we start to address the, the overall housing affordability problem, um, that assessments will stop rising quite so quickly. Well, and I, I'll just say again, it's, it's absolutely worth doing and it helps, but we just need to have a hard, honest look at the limits of, of it. And it's not gonna get us to a truly progressive tax because of the limitations. Um, and that doesn't mean it doesn't help and it's not worth doing. And you can expand the amount of subsidy for individuals below $350,000. But um, I certainly, you know, we certainly could hope that assessments stop rising, but there's certainly no evidence that that is going to happen. <laughs> I guess I'm not saying we hope that we do it. We implement policies so that, you know, the middle of the housing market stops having such a shortage, right? Um, and, you know, I, I think- But we should look at evidence from other cities about whether that will reduce assessment rises. That's all I'm saying. I don't disagree. I'm just saying it's a tough reality we gotta face. Michael, we don't pay you the big money though to tell us the tough reality. <laughs> We, uh, I, I, I get paid in the, the joy of the job. And, and for what it's worth, that comes shining through every time you speak, Michael, I swear it does. So, um, <laughs> any, so uh, any further comment here? Any comments uh, from the public? So I'd, I'd jump in on that uh, comment Michael made about uh, the parking garage um, and yeah, dropping, you know, the 10 million we're gonna spend on that isn't gonna save us on our $100 million school expenditure, but um, it does offer us the opportunity uh, to make better use of that $5.4 million piece of land downtown, um, which could potentially, you know, both A, reclaim some of that money we already spent on it um, in cash, uh, B, help create new housing, um, and see even, you know, make more new tax revenue in the long run. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a conversation with Mr. Sales uh, a couple months ago, um, and he pointed out that there's uh, federal loan programs that we could potentially leverage um, in order to uh, build it without using our own bondable capacity um, to, to put kind of workforce housing on top, um, maybe without even really significant expenditures for the city. Um, so, I mean, the background there is, you know, we promised to give the county 90 spaces uh, in a parking structure on that lot, um, and staff decided to build a 306 space garage uh, to satisfy that at about $50,000 per space. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously demand for the downtown garages has plummeted during COVID, and we don't know how it's going to return um, post-COVID. Uh, so, it sounded like yesterday, council decided to push uh, push off the plan by at least a year to fiscal 2023 um, in order to examine our options better. Um, so I'm hoping that this time uh, when we have our time to look at our options, uh, we don't just run out of the clock, um, you know, trying to keep that 306 demand or parking structure demand in, in place um, and, uh, and really look at what we can do to better use that land. Um, we know from the, uh, the form-based code uh, bonus height analysis that, you know, if you keep your parking structure or your concrete podium at the base of your building um, to two stories or less, you can do stick built construction on top, which is significantly cheaper than the uh, concrete and steel construction uh, you would need if you build three stories of garage and then more on top. Um, and we know from our November uh, planning commission meeting um, that because it's a city owned parcel and a city owned uh, project, council has the ability to essentially waive any zoning rule. Um, so it was previously being examined under the constraints of uh, the downtown zoning it's in, uh, which is pretty restrictive. Um, basically above the third story, you have to have a like 10 or 15 foot setback or step back. Um, and because the parcel is long and thin, 
uh, that pretty much precluded the viability of any structure on top. Um, but uh, you know, if if we change those rules uh, or waive them um, or remembered that zoning is a made up construct that isn't real, um, we can choose to make the most of that site. Um, and in a, in a 40,000 square foot footprint, um, you know, at a thousand square feet for a generously sized unit and 80% yield, if you put four stories of housing on top, you could fit 160 apartments there. Um, so something to think about as we move forward with that process. Um, and, you know, maybe hack will play a role in uh, trying to figure out how we can best use external funds to take advantage of that program, given our own funding constraints. I want to piggyback. I know we're running late on time, but I want to piggyback on that and respond to something that Michael said and continues to say, and I appreciate Michael speaking, um, tempering and managing expectations around funding. And um, it, there's no question that revenues are short. The one thing I would um, really stress is that um, uh, leverage, uh, outside leverage require, often requires a local match and it it's happening more and more. So more and more federal funding sources that, um, that we're able to bring into the community for things like energy conservation, rehab, home ownership, rentals uh, require a certain percentage um, um, uh, local match. Uh, and most of that has not been, most of those opportunities for local matches have not been funded for three straight years now. And so it's one thing to cut off the spigot. It's another thing to cut off your nose to spite your face. So let's just don't make, I just would re recommend that we don't um, make non-strategic decisions um, where we cut the budget with, a, with an ax rather than a scalpel. And let's actually look and dig in and see what uh, outside funding sources are available for leverage and make sure that we at least maintain enough um, local match money so that we can bring in outside funding. And that's, that's, I'll get off my soapbox at this point. Great. Great. Anything else to come before this committee at this time? So are we just at a standstill and, until the, um, the consultants get back with us? What's our continued focus from this point? Uh, you're using us. Us who? Hack. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, at this point, uh, I think uh, and where, where the hack has functioned best, frankly, what we've been suffering under recently uh, has been um, in the interplay between the needs and requests of council and staff and, you know, coming to us for, you know, address problem X, look at thing Y, let's work on Z. And one of the casualties of COVID has been that interplay as everyone has just been on the treading of water. So my hope is that with a stabilization coming to process in the city that we are going to be able to engage with how to implement this as we go forward in uh, what pieces of the affordable housing plan look like and how to stand them up and what works in what order and, uh, and to respond to the requests of council and staff on what they need from us in terms of technical expertise and responses to it. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, as uh, senior management gets put into place, we can be brought back onto the field for that sort of stuff. But that's something that we haven't been as aggressively on the field this year or last year as we have in years past. Um, so um, hopefully Mr. Boyles will be bringing stuff to us and uh, we can start uh, addressing some of those issues. I guess that's where I'm, I guess that's where we are at the moment. Okay, uh, no further questions from the public either. Any other matters to discuss at this time? I will entertain any and all motions. A motion to adjourn the meeting. Great, there's, there's a motion to adjourn the meeting on the floor. Seconded. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody Aye. opposed? Thank you very much.
uh, as I always close these meetings, uh, you don't have to go home, although most of you already are, but you can't stay here. Thank you very much. Take care now. Bye.